All right, so this is a Wildlands Trust virtual program. Welcome and thank you for coming. I wanted to tell everybody about Wildlands Trust today before we get started. We are a nonprofit uh, land trust working throughout southeastern Massachusetts, and our mission at Wildlands Trust is to conserve and permanently protect native habitats, farmlands, and lands of high ecological and scenic value in order to keep our communities healthy and our residents connected to the natural world. This is our service region. We started in Plymouth in 1973, right here where I am in Plymouth in my hometown. And now we serve the entire region of Southeastern Massachusetts and we are in over 40 towns. We have about 10,000 acres of land protected across the region. And we do that by um, either buying or having land donated where we own and protect that land. And we also have a feature that all um, land trusts across the country use called the conservation restriction or a conservation easement, where we help protect privately owned land. Um, and then once we have that land, we have to take care of it. So our land stewardship department maintains the trails. They help keep everything safe for people, help improve habitat for wildlife, help keep our waters clean. And they're out there around the clock. We've been working really hard lately as we've been uh, one of the only organizations at the early stages of this pandemic that kept our preserves open to the public. So we've been working really hard to keep up with that increased foot traffic. And um, we thank everybody who's been visiting during this time. We also have a department, and this is where I come in, the education and community engagement, where we offer uh, public programs to keep people informed and engaged with what is going on with conservation in the region. And finally, um, we couldn't do our work without the collaboration and partnership with the towns in our region, the town governments, other nonprofits in our region, and the state agencies as well are huge partners in our ability to protect land. And finally, this is where you come in, our members. I know there are a lot of members on this call today, and I thank you so much for your support over the years. Um, you can become a member if you're not already for just $50 a year. And that goes directly towards our ability to continue to protect more land and take care of those properties. Um, right now, through the end of our fiscal year, June 30th, we have a one-to-one -one matching gift. So this is a great time to join because your impact will be doubled. You give $50, we'll get $100. Um, and then another benefit right now is our, our nod to the people who are on the front lines. If you join before uh, June 30th, in your membership packet, you will get a card where you can donate a um, one year free membership to a healthcare worker in your life to help get them out on the trails. And our trails are free and open to everybody, but our members do help support our work. So really appreciate that. I'm gonna be sending a follow-up email to everybody who registered with a link to the membership so you can learn more. And then any links to um, that Blake would like to share and other links to follow up on this program. So you'll be receiving all that. But you can find all of this information on our website at wildlandstrust.org. Today's workshop is Tick and Mosquito Safety, one of my favorite annual workshops this year. Instead of just ticks, we're also talking about mosquitoes. So that's a little bit new this year if you've been to the talk in the past. Uh, Blake Dinius is our Plymouth County entomologist. He's really wonderful. And his job is to bring this information to all of the people across Plymouth County. We're gonna debunk some myths and learn a lot of good stuff today. And I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to Blake. Thank you so much, Blake, for doing this for us. Thanks, Rachel. Can everyone see this okay? I can see it. All right, perfect. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as Rachel said, my name's Blake Dinius. Um, so that's me right there. Uh, I really like doing a lot of stuff outside. Uh, this is me at, uh, at the top of Mount Washington. So I, that, was, that was a really good time. Uh, but before I got this job, I was in research and primarily worked with honeybees. Um, so this is a procedure that you would use to graft honeybees from a hive and put them into uh, well plates where you can watch them develop. Uh, but I also worked with a number of other types of insects like lacewings, ladybugs, and I worked with non-insects like earthworms and springtails as well. In my current role, uh, my job is mostly education, so I'll go into schools or libraries, give programs to teenagers, adults, or kids, or I'll even lead uh, nature walks or go and uh, identify insects for people that might need. I had a, a gentleman call me who wanted me to identify some ants for him, for instance. Uh, so I, I do like house calls of that sort. 
Um, but you can really just think of me as a giant bug nerd. I've really been into bugs my entire life, and it's just so something that I really, really enjoy. So today we're going to talk about some bugs that people don't enjoy, which are ticks and mosquitoes. Um, so we're going to talk about these suckers because they drink our blood. Um, blood feeding is really, really old. With ticks, we estimate that it's about 400 million years old. Um, but why do ticks and mosquitoes drink our blood? So one of the things about ticks and mosquitoes is we think that the blood feeding had adapted from plant feeding. And if you look at these bugs down here, you can see this bug feeding on a plant tissue. It has that long mouth, pointy mouth part that it's sticking into that plant leaf. It might be a, a very similar to this kissing bug on the right that's using it, the same point, kind of pointy mouth part and sticking it into skin. Uh, blood is very, very nutritious. It has all these different nutrients. An interesting thing about uh, bugs is they're not able to produce um, the necessary sterols for their body, um, so they do need to get them from other locations. In the case of mosquitoes, they're kind of like surgeons, so they're, they're actually, they have really sharp pointy mouth parts, and they'll actually try to cannulate a blood vessel with those pointy mouth parts. They're really, really quick feeders. Uh, and so they'll do this in a matter of minutes. And they'll really get all the blood that they need. It's only the females in mosquitoes that use the blood, that feed on blood. And they do this for egg production. And you can see this Asian tiger mosquito here on the left feeding on blood and getting nice and big. And then she's going to use that and digest that blood over a, a course of days and lay these eggs on the side of containers. The males only feed on nectar, so both males and females will take, uh, take food from flowers, but it's only the females that are responsible for drinking our blood and spreading disease. Ticks, on the other hand, are different from mosquitoes. So ticks are long-term feeders, and you can see this tick kind of going in, uh, going ham on your skin on, on the left here. Um, what, it, what this does is there, you know, if the mosquitoes are really precise, sur you know, surgical feeders. The ticks are really messy feeders. They go in and just make a mess of stuff. So if you look at the picture on the right, the, the tick is going to do uh, what we call is form a feeding lesion. And this is like a, a pool of blood under your skin. So it's not looking for a blood vessel. It's actually just going in and it's going to mess up and cause a lot of damage under, underneath your skin in that tissue. And then it's going to feed from that pool over the course of about a week. So mosquitoes, very accurate, feed for about a few minutes, ticks feed for days, and create a huge mess underneath your skin. And with ticks, all the life stages feed on blood. It's not just the females. The babies and the, the nymphs, which are like kind of like the teenagers, and the adults will all take a blood meal. Uh, and this is the only thing that ticks feed on. They don't feed on anything else. When it comes to the diseases that these uh, the ticks and mosquitoes are spreading, it appears as if there are more of them that have been occurring recently. So when you think about this, this is just a diagram uh, of, of ticks, of tick-borne disease discoveries. And what you can see is that there were more discoveries in the past 40 years than there were prior to that, especially in the past 10 or so, 10 to 15 years, you see this nice clump where you got Heartland virus, Ehrlichia muris, Borrelia mimotoi, Borrelia mioni. Like all this, this nice chunk here. Uh, so a lot of times people see some data like this and they start to scratch their head and they say, what the heck is going on here? We also have more reported cases of a lot of these tick-borne diseases. Now Lyme disease happens to be uh, the most common arthropod-borne disease in America. And so you have a lot of data for that. And, and what you can see here is that the reporting from 2011 to 2015 the number of dots, uh, if each dot represents a case, really fans out. And you can, but you can see it concentrated right at home uh, in this blue right here in Massachusetts. We had a really bad uh, year of Triple E last year in 2019, and this was just a map taken from the Department of Public Health where you can see that the areas around Plymouth were particularly uh, serious uh, when it comes to the risk of Triple E. So are things actually getting worse? Um, the newspapers that you might pick up might indicate that that might be the case, but I'm here to try to walk you through that to see what's actually going on. Um, the first thing 
is that the science has gotten better. So that's one thing that we really need to consider when we're looking at the number of discoveries of disease and also the number of cases. That certain things might have just flown under the radar in times past. And we know that this is the case with something like Lyme disease, where it has existed for a very, very long period of time. They traced it all the way back to the Ice Age, uh, and that there are cases that just might have been diagnosed as, you know, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or a fever, summer flu, or it's all in your head. And now we're giving these things a name, which might indicate. Uh, or might appear like the cases are increasing, but really just the science has gotten better. But there is evidence that suggests that things have changed, uh, at least since hunter-gatherer society. If you look way back in history, what we find is that hunter-gatherers suffer from relatively few pathogens. There weren't these things like Lyme disease and Tripoli uh, going around inside these uh, groups. We associate this, these diseases with the onset of agrarian or agricultural communities about 40,000 years ago. Uh, and, and this happened because you had you know, destruction of wild hosts, destruction of wild habitat. You had community living, which is really important, especially for some viruses that confer a lifelong immunity. Uh, those viruses would not be able to sustain themselves in populations that had 20,000 or less people. And then you also have close contact with a lot of these animals, living with domesticated animals. So in the case where some of these viruses and pathogens might have been associated with animals, now all of a sudden people are replacing those animals, displacing them, and living close to them. And what you find, we find is that these vectors ended up adapting to a new kind of food, and so did the diseases. So that certain animal diseases could now become human diseases. Um, so something like Lyme, Babesiosis, uh, these, a lot of the tick-borne diseases, what we see is that they're naturally circulating in animals, particularly mice and small rodents. A lot of times people will associate Lyme disease with deer. Um, it, the tick, the black-legged tick or deer tick, needs deer to reproduce, but the, the disease, the bacteria for Lyme, actually circulates in mice. You've got Tripoli e and West Nile virus. These circulate in birds. It's very, very important. A lot of the really cool backyard birds that we like looking at, uh, really that's where the Tripoli virus is circulating. So what we're finding is that as we kind of change uh, land use patterns and we bring ourselves, we build up these homes inside woodlands, we're bringing ourselves in closer contact with a lot of these backyard animals and therefore ticks and mosquitoes. And we're also changing the ecology. We're creating a lot of what we call edge habitat. This is what people tend to refer to as an ecotone. And in this particular habitat, there are some animals that like to exist in that little fringe between woods and yard. And the, so the more suburban habitats you create where you've got that nice fringe, with your house bordered on all three sides by woods, um, the more uh, what we call the more of these hosts that tend to exist. What we're also seeing is the expansion of some other animals, like, like white-tailed deer tend to be expanding a lot more. And we believe that the white-tailed deer is driving some of the expansion of, of, of ticks, both the deer tick and the lone star tick, into areas like Southern Canada and the upper Midwest, into areas where it wasn't necessarily there, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. What we're also seeing too is that degraded habitats are causing a lot of these vectors to increase as well. A lot, vector meaning a mosquito or a tick, something that would carry a pathogen. So for the example of the northern house mosquito, Culex pipiens, likes actually really, really dirty, degraded habitat. So if you look at this top picture on the right, you see that water, it looks like sludge with all this kind of litter and debris. That's actually the perfect habitat for Culex pipiens. It, it absolutely loves that. Lives in sewer systems, just loves these nasty, nasty habitats. Um, and if you look at kind of the things that we leave out in our environments, I actually found these tires. So these tires are actually taken from my, my yard. I found these behind my yard. Someone had left it in the undeveloped land behind my yard, just four tires. And who knows how long they had been there, but I'll tell you this, the, the tires are the perfect breeding container for certain mosquitoes like the Asian tiger mosquito. They're hot, they're black, they sit in the sun, they don't go anywhere, they collect a lot of water, 
very, very ideal breeding habitats. And there are just four of them just sitting in my, uh, behind my backyard. What we're also seeing is that trash, litter are also really important mosquito breeding habitats, especially in poor areas where we find that some, in some uh, more urban areas, um, these are the, the habitats that are preferred are like these small, these basically these cups and trash that are left on the sidewalks. So I'm not allowed to say on the record that climate change exists. I know some of you may be rolling your eyes, but we're just gonna talk hypothetically. If climate change did exist, what would it be causing? So in the case that climate change did exist, what we would be seeing are, especially in mosquitoes, is quicker reproduction cycles. Ticks have more of a discrete life cycle where it's all, oh, this is an annual life cycle, is very predictable, but mosquitoes, you might be seeing a higher population, greater density of mosquitoes. If you look at this example, this mosquito here, Culex tarsalis, this has a 14 day life cycle at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. If you bump that up to 80 degrees, it's now 10 days. So that might not seem like a lot, just shaving off four days. But if you, if you, do, if you multiply that over the course of a summer, you might get a many, many more thousands of individuals over the course of that summer just from that small change in days. Uh, there's something that we're not gonna go into too much detail, it's called the extrinsic incubation period. This is just a really fancy word for saying how long it takes a mosquito from acquiring infected blood to then becoming infectious itself. So it's not like a mosquito can just drink blood and then pass on that disease. They, there's actually a period of time before that mosquito is able to transmit that disease. And that period of time is faster as temperatures rise. So when you look at West Nile virus, the time it takes for a mosquito from drinking West Nile virus to passing it on takes 15 days at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. But it only takes five days at 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can see that bumping up these, these temperatures, you get more mosquitoes. They're able to pass on that pathogen much, much quicker as well. And then you have warm weather species moving further north. On the left, you've got this tick. It's the Lone Star tick. This is a subtropical tick. It's historically found in uh, the south, kind of the southern, eastern. It's not really found in necessarily in Texas. It's found in like the southern portion of the United States. And then you have the Asian tiger mosquito. This is also a, tro a subtropical mosquito, tropical, subtropical. And we thought that this mosquito would never have really made it to Massachusetts. We thought it would be limited by our cold winters but we're finding it in Plymouth County and in, in uh, kind of, Plymouth County kind of represents one of the more northern thresholds for this mosquito. Same thing with Lone Star Tick. So they are moving for, further north more than we anticipated. So where do we go from here? Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen this diagram before. I love this triangle. This is basically represents uh, how disease happens. So you have a pathogen, so something like Lyme disease or triple E, a vector, so a mosquito or a tick, and a host, so a human, a mouse, or what have you. Uh, if you were to knock out any one of these relationships, that, that chair or that table falls over. So that's one of the ways that we can focus on mitigating disease is by really applying pressure to one of these relationships and sometimes two or more. But when you think about something like knocking out the vector pathogen relationship, so maybe the mosquitoes can't pick up the disease. Then you can't. Then people aren't going to get sick, and so that's some, one of the ways that they try to solve that with aerial sprays or controlling animal populations. If you were to knock out the pathogen-host relationships, so maybe you have a lot of infected organisms out there, a lot of infected ticks and mosquitoes, but just the humans can't get sick. So, like a vaccine, for instance, that's another way to wipe out disease. And then the third way we handle things, and this is really the most important relationship because this is the one that you have the most control over and this is the one I really like to focus on is the relationship between the tick or the mosquito and the host or the human us. So this is where things like repellents really come into play. You know there might be a lot of infected organisms out there but the infected organisms just don't eat on you. So when it comes to staying safe there are tools that already exist uh, this is me on the left. I really like getting out there. I love fly fishing. I like hiking. I like watching butterflies and birds. Uh, I really just don't let things keep me trapped inside. Uh, and so, but a lot of these methods that I'm going to go over, 
they've existed in the literature for decades. They've existed for a very, very long time. And what we're finding, at least, is that the issue is really, is, is really a few things. Get, busting a lot of the misinformation and changing some of the behaviors. Some of the things I'm going to recommend to you just might sound annoying, but I will tell you this. If you start doing them, you will see that they are very, very effective and that they will keep you safe. And that, they can be a big ask because uh, it's kind of like getting a generation of people to start brushing their teeth. And I know that, that might be annoying, but um, it's just kind of the way it is. You know, it's, it's, it's a tough, it's a big ask. So one of the things you want to think about when it comes to ticks and mosquitoes is where you find them. Ticks are basically soil organisms. Even though we're used to seeing them on our bodies and our dogs and our clothes, you want to think about the ticks as being basically a little bit like mites and, and maybe earthworms. They're, they're in the soil. Uh, they require really, really high humidity, 82% or an up. And what we also see is that only about 6.3 of the total population of ticks are active at any given time. So when you're out and someone says, oh, I had, a, I had a 10 ticks on my body just walking through the woods, you think the 10 ticks are only about 6% of the entire tick population that you could have been exposed to. So there are a lot of ticks out there. And most of the time they're spending their, their life nestled up against that soil layer. Mosquitoes, on the other hand, are basically aquatic organisms. So like I said, you might see the mosquitoes, we associate the flying mosquito buzzing around our ear, but this mosquito needs water at all stages of its life to lay eggs, to develop as larva, as a pupa, and even to emerge as an adult, it needs water. The only place, you know, you find mosquitoes, you know, you can find them as high as 3,000, uh, three, three, uh, sorry, it's, um, 3,000 meters above sea level. You can find them in deserts. You can find them in the Arctic tundra. But the only place you really don't find mosquitoes is Disney World. And the reason for that is that Disney World has developed a lot of strategies uh, to manage water. And so proper water management can do a really big number on mosquitoes. So for yard management, this is, this is a fun little game. Uh, these researchers, looked at all these different features that were reported to kind of either increase or decrease tick populations. So you had things like people, you, you pick up the paper and you might read, oh, if I have a wood pile, I might have more ticks. Or what if I create this barrier around my yard of mulch, maybe that'll reduce ticks. And then someone says, oh, I saw deer in my yard. Uh, maybe that increases ticks or Japanese Barbary down here on the on the bottom row, or maybe if I have a cat to eat all the mice, maybe that'll reduce the number of ticks. But what these researchers found is that not all of these things increased tick populations. It was just these four. So the presence of a rock wall, having a fence, being near a forest, and the presence of trash. So these were the major things that kind of increased the, the number of ticks in those areas, that increased the risk in those areas. Um, and the, the the rock wall really seemed to matter if there wasn't if if it was if there was one uh, border of of that yard that was near forest and same thing with the fence it seemed to really matter if the house was near the forest but none of these things like having a few plants of Japanese Barbary having a garden seeing deer none of those things seemed to matter um, it was just these things. So some of the few things that, that also seem to matter is, is how much how many leaves you have in your yard. So raking up leaves can make a huge difference. I know everyone's probably has these nice well-groomed lawns, but I want you to remember this information come fall where you can reduce the number of nymphs in your yard by raking leaves. Yard sprays, I wanna talk a little bit about yard sprays. So yard sprays for ticks are, are different than yard sprays for mosquitoes. So with ticks, they, can, they, they have been really good at reducing tick populations and they can last a very long time. What we see is that most ticks exist kind of in this edge layer that abuts a forest. Some can be found closer to your yard, but this 18.2%, this that's almost all the adults. It's, it's, no, it's almost never the nymphs, which are active right now. What you wanna do is you wanna use a pyrethroid, you wanna time it, and you wanna repeat this yearly. You can hire someone or you can do it yourself. But if you do this year after year, you can get close to 100% reduction of the number of ticks in your yard. It is extremely effective. I don't personally do yard sprays, um, but
but this is something that I like to give people as a tool. I know it's a very contentious topic. Some people like chemicals, some people don't, but uh, if you're someone who, you know, you invite a lot of kids over and you have a lot of kids running around, you don't, you're worried about them, you don't know if they're gonna do tick checks, I would highly recommend a yard spray. If you wanted to do, go with a do-it-yourself approach, you, these ready-to-spray products you see down here, really easy to use, uh, very, very effective. You want to get something EPA registered. The important thing is that it's made for lawns and gardens. You don't want something that is going to be meant for spraying uh, in houses. It's just not going to be the same. And it should be labeled to control ticks or deer ticks. And then lastly, you want to follow the label. But basically, you'll take this spray, hook it up to a hose, and you'll spray about seven, the, the seven feet that kind of abuts your, your yard. So you just do the perimeter around your house with about a seven foot width with this spray and you, you'll do that. You can do that now and you would wanna do it again like mid June. And then if you do that again year after year, you should see this very, very significant reduction in the number of ticks. Mosquitoes on the other hand, so mosquitoes are a little bit different. Uh, mos most mosquitoes, there are some mosquitoes that fly very far, but most mosquitoes fly about two kilometers or less. So they're gonna, you're, that's about um, a mile and a quarter. So even though you may have a pond down the street, chances are that the mosquitoes are not coming from that pond where you have a lot of fish and dragonflies and, and other predators that are controlling those populations and keeping them checked. Chances are they're coming from right around your house. So when I look at this house, um, a lot of times people say, well, there's no pond there. How can mosquitoes be there? Well, mosquitoes can be in all these different locations. And when you think about it, um, that, that's typically where you're gonna, you're gonna find the mosquitoes. And so uh, we're, when we talk about managing mosquitoes, we're talking really about cleaning up these sources that you may find them in. So mosquitoes can breed in a, a, boat the, a, a bottle, basically a, enough water that fills a bottle cap. So that's all the water that they need. They don't need a ton of water. So things like bird baths, potted plants, gutters, um, these corrugated gutter systems are really excellent mosquito breeding habitats. They've got a lot of organic matter that builds up in there the mosquitoes feed on. And if you think about each one of these ridges as enough water the size of a bottle cap would be each one of those little ridges would be a mosquito breeding habitat with no predators or anything to keep those in check. So one of the things you can do is you can keep the water moving. Uh, that's really important. Mosquitoes can't survive in moving water. Their larva and their pupa just cannot live in moving water. So keeping that water moving a really good idea. If you can't do that, then replacing the, your bird baths and water every week will be enough to kind of prevent those mosquitoes from forming. Mosquito yard sprays. This is a really tough subject. Uh, to be honest, if we were going to dive completely into this, it would take its own entire program. But what it really comes down to is the sprays are variable and they're temporary. So you're not getting this excellent control that you get with ticks. You're getting very temporary control. And how you conduct the spray really, really makes a difference. What product you use, what species you're targeting. We have over 50 species of mosquito in Massachusetts. They fly at different heights. They fly at different times of the day. They fly at different times of year. So what you're spraying, when you're spraying, is really going to impact the kind of control that you get. Um, and again, they don't last very long. Mosquito, like I said, ticks have that very discrete breeding cycle where they have only like one generation every two years. Mosquitoes have, can have multiple generations in a given year. So the, the sprays are a little bit tougher. Uh, what I would recommend is instead of paying someone to spray your yard uh, where you don't know what kind of control you're getting, that you go through the Plymouth County Mosquito Control Project or your local mosquito control project. This is because you've got the, the trained professionals they're actually, they actually subscribe to certain rules that the, the private contractors don't. So they'll, they actually obey a greater, basically, they don't spray in certain areas because they're worried about the, the damage it would cause, versus your private, car, primary, uh, your private contractors are not bound by those same restrictions. Um, and it's free. I mean, above all, why wouldn't you go with the free thing? Um, and so you can, you can call them and you can get up to eight sprays per year uh, from the mosquito control project. Um, what I would recommend doing is because it's variable and temporary that you only really do this uh, 
if you're going to have like a cookout or something and you get the spray done the day before, it's not a very good method at just reducing mosquitoes in your yard. It's just not going to work like that. So what about going into tick habitat or they should say or mosquito habitat as well. Um, the first thing you want to do is, is you want to cover up. Um, everyone says that, but to be perfectly honest, if people want to use non-toxic, non-chemical approaches, you can't get much more than, than non-toxic and non-chemical than just covering up. Um, for mosquitoes, there's netting. Uh, this is this guy on the left, he is like he's making this really nerdy fashion statement. I will tell you this: if you're up in the backwoods of Maine or if you're in New Hampshire, you bring one of these nets. It will be a game changer. It, it is like a complete lifesaver, and you will thank me for it. I paid about a dollar for my net. I keep it in my car whenever I need it. Tucking your pants into your socks. So there's this, again, a really nerdy fashion statement. Uh, but the reason that I do this is because ticks sometimes crawl up this gap between your pants. And not to be too disgusting, but I once had a guy tell me that the tick attached in a location that made him pee in two different streams. And the last thing I want to do is end up in a situation where I have a tick making me pee in two different streams. So this is why you would tuck your pants into your socks, um, just to make sure that that tick can't crawl up into those locations that only your doctor should have access to. Time of day seems to really matter, especially when it comes to mosquitoes. With ticks, some people will tell you that ticks are, are more like dawn and dusk biters, but after the surveillance work I've conducted, I'll tell you that you can find ticks any time of the day. Um, it doesn't really seem to matter. But with mosquitoes, um, the time the, the, you can find mosquitoes any time of the day, but the ones that are carrying the pathogens seems to really make a difference depending on the day. So when you look at the number of pools tested. So when mosquito, the mosquito control uh, tests mosquitoes, they test them as groups. They don't test individual uh, mosquitoes. And so the, you had 34 of the 428 pools of mosquito come back positive for Triple E. That's what this says at the top. And that's for the day biting mosquitoes. And only one pool of day biting mosquitoes came back positive for West Nile virus last year. But if you look at the night and twilight biting mosquitoes, you had 394 of those pools uh, were positive for Triple E, uh, were night and twilight biters. So you can see that the larger fraction of, of these night and twilight biters are, are carrying this Triple E or this West Nile virus. So that's why limiting your, your activity to daytime can really make a difference. But the risk never really drops to zero is, is kind of what this shows. So even if it's the middle of the day, you should really be still wearing that. Uh, you know, protective coverings or repellents. So uh, going on to repellents, so when it comes to detecting us, ticks and mosquitoes primarily use smell. This tick here, this, uh, this deer tick, is actually blind. She has some photoreception, but she doesn't actually have proper eyes to detect visual uh, cues. So what she's doing now, she's waving around her arms to pick up scent, to pick up the way we smell. With mosquitoes, they also pick up the way we smell. So if you look at this diagram below, you can see this mosquito following arrows and those little gray squigglies, that's actually air current. That's the smell of air current. You can see that she kind of is falling, she actually will follow the scent upwind. So she'll start downwind. And when our scent blows towards her body, she can detect us and she will follow upwind. And she'll, she'll make her way all the way to us just based on the way our scent carries downwind. So you can block that scent, you can block those receptors by using repellents. Traditionally, this was DEET. This is the oldest and really most tried and true repellents, kind of the gold standard. So this is DEET, not DDT. That's really, really important to make that distinction. DDT is not a good thing. DEET is very good. DEET's been in use for a bit, about 60 years. Um, it's had about 700 million applications annually. And since 1998, there's an estimate about 8 billion human applications. So sometimes people will say, well, DEET's toxic. So in that given time, think about all these billions of applications. There have only ever been four deaths associated with DEET, but never confirmed. So these were, these were individuals that had been using DEET, but, and they, they had died later, but we never found the cause of death. We didn't actually know what caused it. It could have been anything. Um, so when you think about that, the, the proportion of people that are actually getting sick from this is minuscule. And you weigh this with the, the, the fact that oh, 1 million people die each year from mosquitoes. You have 300,000 people 
in the U.S. getting Lyme disease, and then falling coconuts kill 150 people per year. So when it comes to DEET, it, it, you're weighing cost, benefit, and risks. I can never say the risk is zero, but when it comes to DEET, um, that, that risk is very, very close to zero, about as close as you can get. But if you still want to hate DEET because, I don't know, you're a hipster or you just want to be cool, um, there are some other things that you can do. Uh, there's picaridin or icaridin, which is, um, you know, they use that in Europe. Um, this is kind of a nice product. If you don't like the smell of DEET, I really, really recommend using picaridin. It doesn't have that crazy scent. And then IR3535, that's a product that's used in Avon Skin So Soft with Bug Guard. The jury is still out on these products below, oil of lemon, eucalyptus, and BioUD. They probably work, but I would just like to see a little bit more data on those to demonstrate that. You have another compound and it's called permethrin or permethrin. It's this compound at the top that I wanna walk you through. If you take home anything from this, it's that this is the best thing you can do to fight off ticks. Um, this doesn't work great against mosquitoes. It works really, really well against ticks. So this is a compound that is found in a number of different kind of bottles. So you have the aerosol sprays, you have some bottle sprays. You can buy this at garden centers or big box stores or Amazon, or you can treat your clothing through Insect Shield. This is a professional company that will do that for you. Um, but this works really, really well because this will actually kill ticks as they climb up your body. You can only apply this to clothing and shoes, so it's not like a repellent. You apply this in advance and you wait for it to dry. It lasts for six washings or one month. So this is something you got to think about differently. It's not a, like, a, like an off where you spray it right before you go. This is something that you need to prepare for. You do this in advance. So what I do is I take all my clothes and my shoes, I spray them the first week of every month, and then that's it. And I know that this is good. And, and uh, especially this time of year, you're going to want to be treating your shoes and socks for sure. In one particular study, they showed that nymphs, um, which are the, the ticks that are, that are about the size of a, a poppy seed, it reduced the nymphal attachment by over 99% just treating shoes and socks. So it's very, very effective. Uh, but you want to keep cats away until it's dry. Um, this is because this product, it mimics a plant toxin and cats are susceptible to plant toxins. And so, uh, but if it's dry, it's a-okay. So this is my cat, Khaleesi. She's on my lap. Um, if you guys want to hang around after the program, I can show you she's on my lap again now. Um, and, uh, She's on, you know, in this photo, she's on pants that are treated with permethrin, and she's okay. And I've spoken with veterinarians on this topic, and they say the exact same thing. They say, wait for it to dry, then you're good to go. I want to talk a little bit about the, the all-natural products, or what we call 25B exempt. It's not necessarily that they don't work at all. The biggest issue with them is that there's no evidence of safety or efficacy. We just don't know. And some of them may be no better than water. So especially if you go, like if you look at this bottle on the left, I could have, that could be lemonade. You know, you, you don't even know. And I could sell that as a bug repellent and there's nothing illegal about that. So I could be selling lemonade as a bug repellent and, and no, you couldn't press charges or anything. There's nothing you can do against that. It's completely legal. Um, so it's not, what we see is that it's just not regulated. They're not regulated at all. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about myths. So uh, tick tubes, when it comes to controlling ticks, they're just not reliable protection. You know, they work, they, in the number of studies I've seen, they tend to work, not work more often than they, I've seen them demonstrated to work. They just, they don't seem like very reliable protection at all. I would not waste my money on these. Um, citronella candles, the same thing, not reliable protection. Mosquito bracelets. So this one on the left, this says off clip on, this one actually works, and this is because this contains a product called metaflutherin. So the same kind of product that I'm asking you to treat your pants with, and the same stuff that they would use to do like a mosquito, like an aerial spray, this is the same class of compound that you would be clipping to your wrist. So you think about uh, maybe it's like doing an aerial spray all around your body as you're walking. Uh, of course, this product worked. Um, the other is like this kind of live strong band and this mosquito sonic repeller. Um, these zero protection, they, they don't work. They're a scam. I would not uh, use these at all. Treatments for cats and dogs, really, really important because especially for dogs when it comes to ticks,
because dogs are, you, they're kind of like Trojan horses where you might let them to go uh, outside to go to the bathroom and then they come back in. They can bring in some ticks, drop them off on your couch. And while that tick might not live very long inside your house, it might live long enough to bite you. And then uh, it's really important to uh, use the proper protection on the right kind of animal. So even though the packaging looks very similar on these two products, um, one is made for small dogs, one is made for small cats. Tick checks are really important. You, like I said, ticks are long-term feeders. They're gonna be feeding on your body for up to a week. What they found in, the, in this particular study is that 90% of the people did not remove the nymph tick. So you, you're looking at this child, maybe they have a nymph tick on their head, didn't remove that nymph in a day or less. So a lot of times doctors and, and people will tell you, if you get that tick off in 24 hours or less, you're good to go. Well, nine out of 10 people didn't do that. Uh, so it's not something that's really reliable. And then in this other study, they found that 81, over 81% 81 of the people who had Lyme disease never remembered being bit. A lot of the questions, sometimes people come up and talk to me after my talks and they'll say, I had Lyme disease and I, I never even saw the tick. Well, that's, that's about 81% of the individuals. Uh, so you're kind of in the majority when it comes to that. Uh, it's very, very common to, to not remember being bit by the tick and getting Lyme disease. If you find the tick, it's really important not to overcomplicate things. So this is an example of a uh, life hacks on the left. It's a guy who's repairing a sink with ramen. Nowadays, I feel like you can search the internet and find a different way of doing just about anything. And so when it comes to removing ticks, there is just, you just wanna go with the old way of doing things, just the tried and true. You just wanna wear, grab a pair of tweezers, firmly grasp it, pull straight up. That's it. You wanna grab really close to, the, to your body because the, the disease of the tick is in this gray area below here. So if I can, um, let me try to circle it. It's in this gray area, like right in here. So that, <laughs> so terrible, I'm not an artist. Don't, don't, don't criticize me. But it's in that gray area in the back. So you wanna get that body off. A lot of times people will uh, say, well, I left the head, is that okay? The head is really just the mouth parts and the disease is not in those mouth parts. It passes through them, but it's not where the disease resides. And so the Lyme bacteria is in the back end. So once you get that back part out, your, your risk of disease transmission stops and that, that head or mouth parts that stays embedded, that's really just like a splinter at that point. That's not gonna really do you much harm if you apply some bacitracin or neosporin or some kind of antiseptic. Uh, so if you're feeling symptoms, the most important thing that you, you need to do is not Google the symptoms because a lot of the symptoms for mosquito and tick-borne disease, they're very general. Uh, things like headache, nausea, fever, memory loss, uh, fatigue. And so, I mean, I feel like that almost every single day. And I feel like I get more like that as I age. So it, if you were to Google that, you're going to come up with this whole list of things like, oh, I have West Nile virus and Tripoli and Lyme disease and babesiosis. It, it, the best thing to do is to gather some evidence and see a medical professional um, they're much, much better at diagnosing these things, and um, you don't want to play doctor with these kinds of things, because some of these diseases, if left untreated, untreated can be fatal. So if you're bitten by a tick, um, really important thing is to keep track of when you were bit, because we know that the onset of symptoms happens a certain period of time after you were bit by the tick, so you want to record when you were bit. Um, if so, what species? So knowing the species can be really important. Um, in this case, like you've got Lyme disease, babesiosis, anaposmosis, Poisson virus, and relapsing fever in the green, that's the green of the pie chart, that's transmitted by the deer tick. No other tick in, the, in Massachusetts can transmit those five diseases. So if you have a dog tick or, or wood tick is what we used to call it, that can never transmit Lyme disease. So, so again, it's really important to know what species of tick has bit you. You can also send that tick off and get it tested. So this, this image here is the bottom is a, it's, it's a tick report from UMass Amherst. And they've actually tested the, the species of bacteria inside that tick. And we can see it came back with a few hits. 
we were positive. One was for um, Borrelia burgdorferi, the agent that causes Lyme disease, and one was for Babesia microti. This is not a bacteria, it's a protozoan. It was also positive for that. The important thing about this tick report is that those two diseases, those two pathogens, they're treated differently with different medication. So, and then the bottom one, babesiosis can be fatal if left untreated. So having, knowing what's in that tick can tell that doctor a lot of information about what you might've been exposed to. It doesn't guarantee that you have it, but it can put that disease on the doctor's radar. Rashes, if you have any rashes, photograph them. We all have really great cameras on our, on our phones. Um, take a picture of it, there's no reason not to. Um, show the doctor. So these two rashes at the bottom, they're both the bullseye rash from, uh, from Lyme disease. So even though the one on the left looks like a perfect bullseye and the one on the right looks almost like a bruise or maybe even an insect bite, they're both the bullseye rash from Lyme disease and a doctor would be able to diagnose that. So the bottom line is that with the right knowledge and awareness, vector-borne diseases are preventable. And at this point, I'll take any questions. I know we went through all the information really quickly and sometimes I tend to talk a little bit faster than I feel like I should. Um, but I'm happy to go over any points if they were missed. That was perfect. Thank you, Blake. Um, let's have you go to the stop share for your presentation. And then we can see who has their hand raised. And again, you can use both the chat feature and the hand raised feature to ask your questions. So I am going to, Christine, I'm going to unmute you so that you can ask your question. Go ahead. Christine, go ahead. Okay, maybe not. All right, any other raised hands? So go ahead and um, click on participants and then you can click on the raise hand. Oh, sorry. There. Hey, am. Christine, you had a question. <laughs> I'm sorry. My question is, um, when I go outside for a while, I um, come home and I have long hair and scrub my hair in the shower and scrub my scalp. Does that get rid of the nymphs if I do it right after I've been outside? So yeah, so, so taking a shower, there's a, there's a couple points I want to kind of address with that. So uh, first off, to answer your question, that taking a shower right off can dislodge some, some ticks that are unattached. If they have a, on average, it can take about 30 minutes to two hours for a tick to attach for climbing up onto your body. So you don't know when that tick was on you, but it, it, it can take a long time. And so showering right after can help. If they're attached, it's not going to do anything. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is you're talking a lot about your hair and your head. Ticks, uh, again, they're soil dwelling organisms. They climb from the ground up. They, they don't climb trees. They don't climb, they don't fall out of trees. They don't climb trees. They're not parachuting like kamikaze down onto your head. They are always climbing from the ground up. If they are on your head or you're in your hair, they've either crawled from your, your foot all the way up to the back of your neck, or they've gotten there by, you, maybe you set a backpack on the ground and then you took your backpack and you put it on your shoulders and the tick was on the backpack. They, they can be really attracted to the back of our necks and our head. And, uh, and so a tick will climb all the way over an entirely naked body and go right up to the back of your head. They, they'll do that, even though the easiest place for them to bite might be your foot or your ankle. Um, and they will bite those spaces too. But a lot of ticks, they tend to, some ticks tend to keep going and crawling all over your body until they reach that, that spot that they just really, really like, um, which is why some people find them around their head or a lot of people find them around their head. Um, does that answer your question? Um, yes. So if I okay. take a, um, a, like a scrubby type thing and just scrub carefully and look everywhere, that should be enough? Yeah, I would also recommend using your fingertips for a lot of areas that are hard to see, especially if you're someone that lives alone. Um, I always check kind of behind my ears or behind or like my neck, like really quick. So I know, I really know what the back of my neck feels like. It's really weird. But I'm like constantly doing that when I come in from the outside because I'll know what the tick feels like. Um, I, I have basically have a, me a memory of what, what, what that, what my back of my neck feels like. And I'll know if there's a tick there just by the way it feels. And so that can be really good just getting in the habit of doing that. Um, and a tick check, honestly, it's, it sounds like this really daunting procedure, but it shouldn't, 
takes me like like 15 seconds. It takes me not that much time at all. I mean, it takes longer for me to check Facebook. Um, I do that like so often, you know, but tick checks is a hard habit to get into. I, I agree. Even for me, it was a hard habit to get into. Thank you. Perfect. Yep. Thank you, Christine. All right, Paul, you can go ahead and ask your question. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, you. Near the end there, you showed the example of the sealed bag with the tick in it and the label. Yes. Uh, and I recollect reading that you can um, mail into the University of Massachusetts, I think at Amherst or some other facility that will then give back to you the uh, diagnosis or what was in the tick, if any. Uh, how do we access those envelopes and how do we learn more about that? Okay, so I can have Rachel give you a couple links afterward. There's a few things that you can do. Um, first thing is you can have that tick identified through University of Rhode Island um, and just send a picture. So take a snapshot and they will tell you what species that is, what life stage it is, and maybe even how long that tick has been feeding if you have a really good photo. Um, University of Massachusetts Amherst runs this thing called Tick Report. It's tickreport.com. And that costs money. So you mail it in, you go onto the website, uh, it costs $50 a tick. Uh, in, in years past, it's, it's a little steep. Um, I mean, you can you could get a Wildlands Trust yearly membership for that cost. You know? So I think it's kind of steep um, just for a single tick, but um, they'll tell you what's in it. That was kind of what I was going over at the end where I was showing you that that one report had uh, Lyme disease and babesiosis in it. Um, and they're really good. It, there's other places that will test your tick and some will even do it for free, but I wouldn't trust them. I mean, UMass Amherst, they do it as part of research. They run qPCR. They have all these quality controls. It's really you get what you pay for when it comes to the tick testing. So if you're going to do it at all, when it comes to this kind of risk, you, you would want to go to the, to the right place. And I'd recommend that. Um, in years past, uh, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health had a uh, like a grant, had some funding out that subsidized that tick testing to bring it down to about $15. Um, that funding has run out uh, as of this month. And so now it is back up to the $50 a tick, unfortunately. And there's no, uh, right now, they, they just don't, with all the stuff going on and everything else, we just don't have the money um, to support the, the, the subsidy again, um, unfortunately. I think there's probably some political stuff going on with that, but I can't really get into that. I just don't know. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll send you the links. Um, so it's tickreport.com for the, for the testing and tick spotters is the URI um, thing for, uh, for getting the tick just identified and that's free. So even just knowing the species, even if you don't get it tested, just getting it identified for free before you go to the doctor can help the doctor a lot. Also something that I do is I, if any ticks bite me, I, you know, pull them off, bag them and date them, like Blake said. And then I don't necessarily send it out to get tested, but then if I were to get sick or develop a rash, I can. I have it in a drawer somewhere, so I can spend the $50 if I get sick. That's a really good point, Rachel. I, I like that a lot. And if another thing that people can do is they can take the tick and if they, if the, they can stick it between two pieces of scotch tape. Yep. That's another way to, instead of putting it in a Ziploc bag, just the scotch tape works really well. Okay, we're going to go to Catherine Holmes. Um, you can ask. There. there you go. Perfect. Um, so my question is around the chemicals, and I know that you said that it would probably be, a, you know, a uh, training in itself. But um, how is it that the chemical that you put on the lawn targets the tick and not other insects? You know, I I, I struggle with that. Um, you know, we try to stay chemical, completely chemical free here in my house. My son has asthma and, you know, he's really sensitive to a lot of things. And we also have neighbors that are spraying these things. And I'm just kind of curious if you could give any, at least at a high level, um, some perspective on the tick and mosquito sprays as far as the safety of them is concerned. But also, how do you, how do they differentiate between tick and mosquito? And then one of the um, just on a different, another question that I just have is, um, we have these neighbors with the caterpillar incident that happened um, a couple of years ago, um, you know, and we had so many caterpillars. We also have neighbors that spray the caterpillars in the tree, like they, the Bartlett comes with these fire hoses and spray into their trees um, to kill caterpillars. And I'm curious if that also kills other bugs like ticks and mosquitoes. Thank you. All right, <laughs> so there's a lot to unpack for that, 
for that question. I feel like you've asked a lot and I'm going to try to cover it as best as possible. If I don't, if I miss something, um, you can please feel free to ask a follow-up if I don't answer that question properly, or we could even discuss this, you know, through email or, or you can give me a call. In the um, if you're, if you're just like, but wait, I have more questions. You know, I'm really happy to spend some time talking with you on this. It's a, it's a really important topic and it's very controversial. Um, I don't spend a heck of a lot of time on it just because it can take up a whole presentation. So the first thing you're asking is how do the compounds differentiate between ticks, mosquitoes and other bugs? Uh, the, the short answer is they don't. So when they're spraying for, for mosquitoes and ticks and is that the compound they're using is a general insecticide. So this is a, a broad spectrum. It's, it's going to kill a lot, basically anything that it touches. So it kills a lot of different arthropods. So even the stuff that is, I'm recommending for the ticks, the difference is the timing of the spray. So when you spray that edge area with a, with, for a barrier treatment for ticks, you're spraying just that edge. Um, and so that's going to impact a lot of the soil dwelling organisms that are found in that edge area. So that's going to hit things like ants as well. And, um, some of the pill bugs and things like that, cockroaches and things that are crawling in spiders and crawling things in along that edge. So there is definitely collateral damage when it comes to using the tick spray. Um, when it comes to pollinators, um, unless you're spraying like, uh, you know, a, like a solitary ground nesting bee hive, which is illegal, uh, then you're not gonna really impact them because you're, you're not supposed to spray flowers when it comes to the tick spray. You're spraying just like that leaf shrub layer. Um, just you honestly wouldn't be spraying higher than an inch off the ground when it comes to ticks. So you're not spraying flowers at all. Um, so you should you should really leave a lot of the pollinators um, kind of intact when it comes to that. They shouldn't really be in, uh, impacted much at all. Um, that being said, they they probably could be impacted a little bit because of that. Um, and then you're going to be hit. You know, uh, the idea is that you spray very infrequently too. Just the two sprays. Um, you know, one and then again in June, and then hopefully a lot of the other stuff bounces back and the ticks kind of stay knocked down. Um, that's the idea behind the tick spray. And so like I said, it's kind of contentious, but a lot of times people weigh, well, you know, I've got a kid and, and I don't want my kid to get Lyme disease and, um, you know, I have a lot, or I run a daycare and I can't get sued because my kid picked up Lyme disease or something like that. So they do the yard spray. Um, like I said, I don't do the yard spray because I just don't really find that it's necessary. Um, I don't think that it's really needed. Um, and then uh, even though it is very effective when you do it. Um, the mosquito spray is different and they use a very similar class of compound. The biggest difference between the ticks and mosquitoes is that the mosquitoes, there are many, many different species. They're very varied and they reproduce often. So it's not like one spray can knock down an entire generation of mosquitoes because they're constantly reproducing and they're flying around. The ticks have a very discreet, uh, very set number of generations. And if you knock down that generation with a couple yard sprays, they're going to stay knocked down for that year. Um, then you do it again the next year and they keeps them down. Um, so that's the, that's the idea with the, the tick yard spray. Um, I, the, the same class of compound is used to treat your lawn for grubs. So they're called synthetic pyrethroids. And the, so, the, so people are treating their yard for grubs in, the, in their yard. Um, and then they're afraid to then apply these compounds for ticks. Well, that's kind of like, uh, it's kind of hypocritical because it's the same thing. So it's just one of those things makes your lawn look good and the other thing protects you against Lyme disease. Um, so, and then for the, for the caterpillars, it's going to depend on what they're spraying. So really, really makes a difference on what they're spraying. Chances are the stuff for the caterpillars is not going to impact ticks and mosquitoes at all. Usually when they go up and they spray, do these yards, these sprays for the caterpillars, you, you're probably trying to treat for gypsy moth or winter moth. They're probably spraying something called like um, BTK. It's Bacillus thuringiensis, and the subspecies is Kurstaki. And so that's that. So that uh, is very specific, and it's not even going to affect. Um, it mostly affects Lepidoptera, so it affects moths and butterflies, and so they're going to impact those and caterpillars that are feeding on the leaf. So your your mosquitoes and your ticks are not going to be feeding on the leaves of the canopy of trees. It's just not, not gonna be the same. There are some other products they could be spraying depending on the time of year and the, comp the company, like I, I don't know what Bartlett's spraying, they could be spraying spinosad or maybe even something even more potent than that. Um, I don't know. Uh, does that answer your question, I hope? Yeah, those, that was great, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time, this was excellent. I do have to drop. So okay, thank, thank you again. You. Have a good one.
Okay, Robin, you are up. Hi, um, so I've heard that Guinea, Guinea hens that are not native to here um, have been helpful to, um, because they like to eat ticks. Friends of ours um, own a number of animals, horses, donkeys, dogs, uh, chickens, and um, they were saying that the guinea hens that they brought in really helped, even though they're very noisy. Unfortunately, the nearby fox did away with the guinea hens. And um, so now they are dealing with ticks. So I was wondering, um, we've heard that possum like to eat ticks and wild turkeys. Are there other animals, wildlife, that also like to eat ticks, like um, some of the other birds or um, some mice or, you know, do other wildlife like to eat ticks? There, there are actually, a, if you were to look up uh, the number of animals that eat ticks, you'd find a pretty long list, actually. There are a lot of things that like to eat ticks. Um, but we're, what we find is that it's just not controlling ticks at a level that, the, the acceptable level for ticks for most people is zero. If you were to go outside and find one tick, that's one tick too many for a lot of people. And so even though you have a lot of animals that are consuming ticks, um, it's just not at a level, that it's, it's, it's actually kind of more like balanced, you know, it's, it's not, they're well, uh, the deer tick is going to lay, a single female deer tick will lay about 2,000 offspring, well, 2,000 eggs, right? And that's just one of those. And one of the reasons why we're not completely inundated with ticks is that there's a high degree of mortality that these ticks experience as they mature. And part of that are the number of predators that are consuming ticks. So, you know, there's a wolf spider that really likes, likes ticks called Chizucosa ocreata that, that really likes to eat ticks. There's actually even a wasp, a specialized wasp, they will parasitize deer ticks. And so, but you still find deer ticks, and that exists, they both exist in this area, but you still are finding deer ticks, and it's just because it's not at controllable levels. Um, one thing you did mention though, is the, the opossums and the turkeys, I think are a little bit overstated. Um, the turkeys, there was a good study done by Rick Osfeld who showed that turkeys, they don't consume ticks at all. He had something like, he dropped like something like a hundred ticks in a bunch of pens in each replicate. And when he found the turkeys the next day, they were like 99 or something like that. They, they were, they were, they were almost all there. Um, and so it's, and, and so it, it, the, the wild turkeys just aren't doing anything right. for, um, for deer ticks at least. Um, and mm -hmm. then the, they will groom off ticks a lot but they're not out eating ticks. And so they, they're just really obsessive groomers. So they're not doing too much to really control the populations, even though they're kind of touted as excellent tick eaters. They're just, uh, it's not really there. A lot, honestly, a lot of the research done on tick predators is, is not great. Um, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be asked. Like even with the guinea hen, they, they did that study, uh, I believe it was like in Africa, and it was just guinea hen in, kept in pens. They, they were just kept in pens at the edge of a forest and they found that they reduced the number of adults. And so you don't, we don't even know how that is different if you were to move them into um, an American suburban habitat. It, it's different. <clears throat> um, so one more quick uh, question. Besides the products that you mentioned and treating your clothes and shoes, um, and DEET. Um, so I lean towards, I'm wondering if this product, this has been around for a while um, from Vermont. Um, can you see? Mountain tick repellent? Yeah. I have, I have to look up the active ingredients in that. Yeah, the, uh, I can There's tell you geranium, geranium oil, lemongrass oil, cedarwood oil and alcohol. I mean, so, I, that's what I've been using. I don't, I don't, um, I don't go right into the woods. I'm, you know, I stay on paths and cover up 
with, you know, socks and tuck my socks in my pants and so forth. But like even to go from my house to our compost, I will spray this on my ankles just because you just never know. So that, that, that product would fall into like 25B exempt or the all natural category. That's something that's just not regulated. So that, that product hasn't been tested in a, in a lab or anything like that to demonstrate that it's effective at repelling ticks. So we don't really know if it works. What I can't tell you is the active ingredients in that, and that have been shown in some studies when tested in a laboratory setting, like on like filter paper, like they could take like the, not that product as it is, but just the isolated ingredients, they, they can test that. And some of those have shown repellency, but we don't know what they even do in terms of safety. What we find is that like some of these products when used alone, they do one thing, but when you mix them all together, they start to do something different. Um, and we just don't know what that does in, in terms of human health or, or anything. But if you wanted to use that, if you're really against DEET and you wanted to use that, I'm not gonna tell you no, um, just because I've got a colleague who says, no, don't do that. Um, but I'd rather people use something rather than nothing. And if that's something that you feel safe about using, then, then go ahead and use it. Um, just with the expectation that, that it's probably not going to work as well as DEET. So, so you don't recommend using both together because that would be... You wouldn't need to. DEET De would be good enough. DEET alone would be good enough. Okay, thank you, Robin. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna go to Jen, and then we have a question in the chat, and then we'll go to Cindy. So go ahead, Jen. Hi, so thank you, Rachel and Wildlands Trust. This was a, a really great program. Thank you, Blake, for all your great information. Actually, Robin actually asked my question. So, uh, you know, I was just looking for what kind of predators we can encourage in our own yards. Um, so you, you covered most of it. I guess I'm just wondering about bats or odonates. Are there things that we can do to encourage them? And do you find that they would be a little bit more effective? So the bats, the bats and the odonates mostly for, will be for the mosquitoes. Um, yeah. the, the bats is a funny thing because I love bats, but the bat study that shows them eating mosquitoes is like a junk garbage study. Um, so they're really not as great mosquito eaters. They're good for other things. They're just beautiful and, and they're fun. But mosquito eaters is just not their thing. They, the study was conducted and they had starved the bats and then they put them in a, a room with only mosquitoes. And then they only looked at them for like 15 minutes and then they extrapolated that data across an entire night. So it's like starving me, giving me a hamburger and saying I eat it in 15 minutes and then saying that I'm going to eat 32 times the number of hamburgers over the course of eight hours is... It's not, it, you just can't do that. So it's kind of funny, but um, I still love them for other reasons. The, the, the odonates are good though, because the damsels and damselflies and dragonflies, especially damselflies, are going to be really good mosquito eaters. Um, and you're going to find them a lot in natural habitats. And it's going to be a lot of their nymphs. So the babies um, are going to be really consuming the, the mosquitoes when, they're, when the mosquitoes are also babies. So you'll see them in a lot of natural habitats. Um, and they can be very effective. Uh, I know there are some places where people have introduced those to artificial settings and seen good results. Um, you've got another species of mosquito, it's called the elephant mosquito. That mosquito doesn't feed on blood, it only feeds on nectar as an adult, so you might even call it a pollinator. And then as a, as a larva, as a larval mosquito, it eats other mosquitoes. So this is like probably the best mosquito in the entire world. And so people have had good experience introducing that elephant mosquito into some artificial settings. And it's going to exist in a natural setting. You don't need to do anything about natural setting, but it's going to exist in it. We're really protecting our wetlands and, and the buffer. And exactly. Just, and just generally good conservation work should really mitigate a lot of these things. And the only other note is I use permethrin all the time, the um, product that you mentioned for my field clothes for work and for hiking, and I find it works really well. So I just take my regular field clothes and spray them, um, and it's actually very effective for ticks, so in case people are wondering about those products. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Okay, so we have a question in the chat um, from Val. She wants to know how long you can hang on to the tick in the bag before um, sending it for the test without it affecting the accuracy of the test. 
a really, really long time. So we find that the DNA in the ticks is really stable, but the RNA, so if you were to test it for like Powassan virus, that's a little bit more finicky. Um, but if you're just looking for like Lyme disease, Babesio, just your standard tick panel is what they call it. It can, I don't know the exact time frame, but it, it's, a, it's an incredibly long period of time. So you wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it being degraded by the time they get the, the tick. You would get sick first, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have Cindy up next. Go ahead, Cindy, and ask your question. Cindy, are you still with us? You have a raised hand. If not, I'll go to the next. Oh, can you hear me? Hi, Cindy. Yes, we can. Can deer ticks crawl through mosquito netting? I sewed some overpants made of that material. I hope it works. I'm sorry, could you re repeat the question? I was having a little bit of trouble hearing you. I think, Cindy, is your question, can deer ticks crawl through mosquito netting? Yes, please. Yes, can they? Uh, yeah, yeah, they should be able to, well, I mean, it depends on the size of the, the, the mesh, but I mean, it's, I don't, I actually, you know, that's a good question. I would imagine the larval ticks are really, really, really tiny. So it's, I, I imagine it might be possible for a larval tick. I, I don't know for sure. Your adult ticks and your, um, your nymph ticks, I imagine would have a really hard time getting through that mesh netting. Um, but the larvae are really, really tiny, um, smaller than a mosquito. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I think this is Deb on the iPhone. You're up. Okay, had to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, so uh, thank you. This was, I, I entered late and I, but it was awesome. Just so much great information. Um, it, I was wondering, you had some slides with a lot of statistics on them. I thought those were really interesting. I was wondering where I could get those, that, um, those statistics from. Like I love the one on the um, evening mosquitoes versus the day mosquitoes with um, West Nile virus and Tripoli and that sort of thing. Yeah, sure. I can, I can send over the entire presentation to Rachel and she can distribute that if, if you guys want. I'll just create a PDF of it and if you guys wanted to review some of this stuff. Great. Okay, that would, that would be awesome. Thank you so much. Also, the recording of this program is going to be on our website uh, for the foreseeable future, so you could always go back through and watch it. And um, that's great that you can send us PDF too. Thank you, Blake. I have a question in the chat here. Yeah. Can we okay, freeze? Great. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, Jen wants to know if we can freeze the ticks and then send them out for testing. Yes, you can. Oh, you already answered that. Sorry, Blake, you answered that in the chat. All right, Paul, you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, last quick question regarding the uh, recording. Based on your experience with the others, the other Zoom meetings you've had this spring, roughly how long will it take for you to have the recording up on the website? I want to have it uh, looked at again by children and grandchildren. Sure. Um, I've been able to get the rest of the recordings up within a few days, and now I have a new computer, so I'm hoping to have it up tomorrow. Thank you. You're welcome. No, a new, much faster computer. <laughs> um, all right, Blake, there's a question in the chat about your contact info. Maybe you can type that into the chat. We'll also, if you want to share any contact info, Blake, you can send that in the follow-up email as well. Any other raised hands? Is there anybody maybe that can't figure out the raised hand feature or it's not working and wants to just hop off mute and ask a question now? I got Robin with a raised hand. Go ahead, Robin. It's actually a question from my husband, Carl. Um, he was wondering if ticks can actually jump. Uh, ticks can't jump. They can't jump. They don't. They don't fly. They don't, they don't do any of those things. They're really slow crawlers. It's just really the way they do. But they they have a good machinery for grabbing onto you. They have these hooks on on their claws. 
they're really good at grasping. So they don't actually grip you. They just like Velcro, they kind of hook their claw into like skin or fabric and that's how they grip. Okay, so no, they don't, do not jump. That was no. your answer, right? Nope. No. Thank, thank Final you. Final answer. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Alrighty. Thank you for showing up, everyone. We got one more hand up here. It's an iPad. Who's on the iPad with a hand up? Go ahead. You're going to have to unmute yourself. I just... There you go. This Perfect. is Bill. Um, I have a question about the in, in, still, insect seal products. Um, I had my my pants treated, and I I found a a black legged tick, and I put it on the pants, and they didn't die, or it didn't die uh, immediately. I don't know how long it would take for it to die. And also, are there any any environmental things that would make the the, the treatment uh, uh, fall short in regards to like UV rays? Yeah, so that, those are some good questions. Uh, so with the insect shield, with the, with the permethrin, that is not, it's not instant when you see the ticks die. So I've taken ticks and put them on my clothes where um, the tick uh, you can see the tick crawling around maybe for up to a minute or so. So it can, it, can, it can crawl around for quite a long time before it dies. But if you expose that tick, even for like 30 seconds, and you take it off, that tick will still be crawling around, but it will die eventually. So it, just getting a little bit of exposure, even though it doesn't die right away, it's already been dosed. And so that tick, that tick will die eventually. Uh, cool. When it comes to uh, the product breaking down over time, uh, th there's a lot of things that can break it down, like sun, you're, you're right, like UV rays, a lot of the, the detergents and the high efficiency washing machines can break it down, the heat from the dryer. So it's, it's not infinitely stable, which is why that it only lasts for about six washings when you do the store-bought stuff, but the insect shield lasts 70. That claim about 70 washings, I'm a little bit doubtful of just because, um, that study was conducted before the advent of these high efficiency washing machines. So we don't know, you know, we, it, it probably is somewhere in the realm of, uh, you know, you know, 50 to 70 or, or something like that. But is it exactly 70? If you had less than 70 could, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold them to, you know, if you get 69 washings and all of a sudden it doesn't work and say, Blake said 70, um, don't hold me to it. That, that's a, it was conducted on some studies that I believe were done in like, the early 2000s or, or something like that. So uh, it's, it's different now is what I'm trying to say. All right, thank you. Sure. Peter, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, Blake, sure. how about the Lone Star tick? Um, I'm told that they're very aggressive and they can jump on you. So they, the ticks, if you look at a tick's body, right? And you look at their, their legs, they don't have the physical machinery to actually jump. So not to actually like leap through the air, but the Lone Star Tick is very, very quick. Um, and they are, you're right, they are very aggressive. Um, so they're, unlike the Deer Tick, the Lone Star Tick has very good vision as well. So it will, it can actually see you and kind of hunt you down. Um, it's just kind of scare, a scary thought. I like to think of it kind of like, if anyone's a fan of zombie movies, it's like the 28 Days Later version of the zombies where they like just run after you in like this mad blitz. Um, but yeah, they, they, none of, no ticks, there are no ticks. You can take this home. There are no ticks at all that can jump. Um, none of them have that machi machinery. If it's jumping, it's not a tick. Okay, thank you. I think that might be it for the questions from the crowd here. Thank you guys so much for joining us, Blake. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, we've done the TikTok every year for the past three or four years at Wildlands, um, but having people be able to join from home has, I think, doubled our participation. So thank you all so much. And share this information with your friends, your family, people in your community. Help us keep debunking these myths. Uh, Blake works for the county extension, so if you have a group 
that is in Plymouth County, right, Blake? They can contact you to give a similar talk or even a different talk to your group. Um, Blake will do that for you. Um, he has a Zoom account, so he can do this without Wildlands Trust. So we're grateful that you did this for Wildlands Trust. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, as Rachel was saying, I do a number of these talks. I, I gave a mosquito talk, mosquitoes only this morning. I'm give, I gave a talk on watching butterflies, like how to identify some common species. And I've just been doing this all for free um, via Zoom. So if anyone has any groups or any, anything, or even if you just wanted to like say like you and your friends wanted a Zoom meeting, I could schedule something like that for you on anything from ticks. I did ticks, mosquitoes, butterflies. I'm doing a uh, entomophagy, which is eating insects. Uh, I'm doing like a invasive insects thing coming up in June. So a bunch of these different things. If you just want them, just reach out to me, and uh, it's all free. It's all it's all free, and you know my time is um, basically free. So well, not really free. You guys already paid for it, so you might as well take <laughs> advantage of it. It's such a great resource. We're so lucky to have you. Thank you, Blake. Thank you all for joining. Keep an eye on your email for an email from me through Eventbrite with follow-up information. And uh, keep an eye on the Wildlands Trust website for, for programs that we are working on getting put up. Um, there's nothing, this is the end of our spring series already. So we're working on getting some June and July programs up for you. All right. Thank you all Thank so much. Thank you, Rachel. Bye, Thank Robin. You. Thank you. Thank you.